Funding for Poets and Their Craft on Vermont PBS is provided by Phoenix Books with stores in Burlington, Rutland, and Essex, Vermont. Phoenix Books, supporting our communities in everything we do, from books to authors. Details and information at phoenixbooks.biz. Vermont College of Fine Arts, located in Montpelier, fosters the excellence of established and emerging writers, designers, artists, composers, teachers, and filmmakers through its graduate level programs. Learn more at vcfa.edu. Northshire Bookstores, fostering discovery and serendipity for babies to the ageless, committed to building community one book at a time, with locations in Manchester, Vermont, and Saratoga Springs, New York, and Middlebury Breadloaf School of English and Breadloaf Writers Conferences attract emerging and established faculty, students, and writers from around the country. A summer tradition for more than 90 years. Hello, I'm Mary Jane Dickerson. Not only is Diana Whitney one of Vermont's prized poets, but she's also a Rhodes Scholar and the poetry columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle, a yoga teacher too. In reading her work, I feel as if the words of her poems and the scene that I have witnessed coalesce to define what she accomplishes in her poems. At Bartleby's Books in Wilmington, we joined her for her presentation on the dense fragrance that rises from the earth, nature and desire in lyric poetry. But first, here's Lisa Sullivan, owner of the bookshop. I think that when you read a poem yourself, you are adding your own inflections in and your own experience. And when the poet reads it, you hear it the way that they had intended it. And so it's, it's a just can be a completely different experience. Nature and desire in lyric poetry isn't really a matter of craft. It's a matter of obsession. So I want to begin with a story about a lost manuscript and its discovery. One hot July day this summer, I was visiting my mother in the Berkshires, the rambling home of my childhood cluttered with 30 years of family paraphernalia, crammed basement to attic with clothes, toys, books, boxes of old letters and shoes. My mom has always been a victim of nostalgia, hoarding evidence of a happier past when her four children all lived in the house and when my optimist father was still alive. But lately, she's been working with a professional organizer, a brisk, neat woman with infinite patience and her name embroidered on her apron. Kathy has labeled all the shelves in the linen closet and sorted all the toiletries into new plastic bins. And thanks to Kathy, I found a slim beige box marked Diana on my mom's bookcase. Inside, along with assorted photos and grade school stories written in cursive on construction paper, lay my college poetry thesis, vanished for 20 years. This was serendipity. I had been looking for the half-life of desire as it was called, ever since I'd started work on my first book back in 2012, which is called Wanting It. So you may start to see where the obsession lies. How had I given away all the copies of this thesis and not even saved one for posterity? I'd once even called the Dartmouth English Department asking whether they might still have the thesis. <coughs> and the secretary transferred me to the main library where someone said a copy might be stored deep in the stacks, but probably not. So I reconciled myself to never seeing those poems again. But then in my mother's bedroom, I opened the faded blue cover of The Half-Life of Desire, and I scanned my old poems, resurfaced suddenly after two decades in the past. The central motif of that manuscript was a river, the Connecticut River, beside which my friends and I lived our senior year in college, in a shoddy ranch house overhanging the embankment legendary among generations of students for its high open porch. On any given day, we would jump off that porch three stories straight down into the water. I remember fear, vertigo, exhilaration, and the sweet relief of immersion. We were witnesses to another element, but we were also part of it, always ready to strip off our clothes and swim, to slice through the wading surface with our bodies. 
How many poems did I write about that river? Through my two walls of windows, I watched and chronicled every season. Yellow leaves on dark water in October, pink blossoms floating in May, and the eerie sound the ice made when it formed, reverberating like a wire pulled taut and twanged. The river could express my longing for me, especially in those last months of college when I was a little in love with all my friends, when we knew our life together was ending and each night seemed poignant with loss and hunger. The first poem in the manuscript took place on our porch after a party as we witnessed the ice out on a warm spring weekend. So I'm going to read from this college poem. We stood outside without shoes, watching ice flows emerge from the mist and float downstream. A cortege of ghosts on the Black River, luminous in the wet air, they passed us by on their way from this nowhere to another. So by an associative associative leap, this poem renders the ice flows as spirits, and the speaker confesses that she wants to be haunted, inhabited by some other presence. In reality, that ice moved on, and so did we. But 20 years later, I was struck but by how little had actually changed in my poetry, how I still turned to the natural world as a vehicle for emotion. I was at a life crisis, and I, I was walking with my best friend from college, the same one who I, I told this story last night of when I used to jump off the porch down into the Connecticut River. So the same roommate who I used to do that with, and she was visiting me here in Vermont. And I said, I just you can't really justify taking time away from my family and from work that earns money to write a book of poems. That feels so frivolous. And she said, Diana, I think it sounds like the most important thing that you could ever do. And, and it, was, it was like I needed that reassurance and that affirmation that, that it was, an, you know, like all art, that it, that it was an endeavor worth pursuing, that it was... Um, you know, just for the pure sake of creativity, for my own heart and soul. The etymology of desire is from the old French, désiré, drawn in turn from the Latin, and I'm not a Latin scholar, but I think it's desiderare, and the original sense translates to await what the stars will bring. Desiderare likely comes from the phrase desidere, meaning from the stars. And so the word desire like originates from the beyond, from something outside the human world. In lyric poetry, we can express the, our longing, the experience of longing with more subtlety and more power when we write about nature. Nature poetry is often maligned as dull and sexless, perhaps because it's been associated with Mr. Wordsworth rambling the Lake District with journal in hand, writing about snowdrops and daffodils. No offense to the romantics, but the poems that I want to talk about here tonight possess more urgency and heat. Eroticism is first and foremost a thirst for otherness, says Spanish poet Octavio Paz, in his remarkable book, The Double Flame, Love and Eroticism. Is eroticism the same state as desire? Not exactly, but let's assume that the two are kindred spirits and that desire is also an energy directed outwards, a movement towards the other. In Jane Kenyon's brief poem, September Garden Party, she captures an erotic moment, a true lyric occasion Lyric meaning one moment in time as opposed to a narrative poem, which is telling a story. An erotic moment using just a few sensual images drawn from nature. Like many of Kenyon's poems, it is deceptively simple, written with transparent language and clean syntax. We sit with friends at the round glass table. The talk is clever. Everyone rises to it. Bees come to the spiral pear peeling on your plate. From my lap or your hand, the spice of our morning's privacy comes drifting up. Fall sun passes through the wine. So on the outset, nothing much happens at this garden party. But there is an abundant movement in this poem, a rising that encompasses the clever talk the entranced bees, and especially the lover's scent that's drifting up. And that final image of sun passing through wine becomes a moment of transcendence, 
a radiant act of intermingling where light and liquid meet. Kenyon conjures erotic intimacy by transferring the action. The bees and the spiral pear peeling are central to her eroticism. They embody the purely instinctual animal aspect of desire and its irresistible sweetness. We watch the speaker watching the bees, and then we catch a whiff of pleasure that she has experienced, the spice of our morning's privacy, which remains hidden under the table, even more alluring because of its secrecy. Very, very short poem. It's only nine lines, and the lines are short, and the sentences are short, and yet something happens. Um, and this, this private experience is shared and we feel um, privileged kind of by, by being brought into this secret. I discovered a um, wonderful Scottish poet, John Burnside, this summer. Um, I was lucky enough to review his book for the San Francisco Chronicle. So even better, it just came to me in an envelope in the mail. <laughs> it's such a gift. Um, and Burnside's poems burn with a cold fire in a half feral landscape of fog and ice. He's published over a dozen collections in the UK and won his country's most prestigious prizes, but he only ventured across the pond in July, making his American debut with Black Cat Bone. The book reveals an infinite kinship, those are, um, that's one of the lines from his first poem, between humans and animals, and reading it, I recognized in Burnside a kindred spirit. His poems sing of desire and grief, their emotion made palpable through clear imagery and musical lines. Whether the speaker is dreaming of an unfaithful lover or stalking a nameless quarry through the woods, my heart like a fettered thrush in the well of my throat. He talks about birds a lot. I have a dream. She's in an attic room with someone else hands in her skirt and that dove sound caught in her throat that I thought was ours. She's with him now, she bends into his kiss, and when she slows his hand, they swarm like bees, a honey slick, an after-gloss of meadow, easy and damp, though not without a trace of venom. They are pure as animals and selfless, like the rhythm in the heat that now and then mistakes itself for hunger and blessed, strung like pearls on molten wire, to bell and cry beneath a hunting moon. They come together, live, unwarranted, a braid in every touch, a flame for longing. Well, in this poem, this vivid nightmare that the speaker's having of infidelity turns to the animal world for images. First, the speaker hears that dove sound caught in her throat that I thought was ours. And then soon after, like in the Jane Kenyon poem, Burnside uses bees to illustrate a sexual scene. And when she slows his hand, they swarm like bees, a honey slick, an after gloss of meadow. These compound words are lush in the mouth, honey slick, after gloss. Sibilant, they resonate in the body and suggest a visceral desire. We feel without knowing their meaning. Intuitively, the poet has created new words out of his longing and his envy, honey slick, after gloss, embodying Octavio Paz's claim that poetry is an eroticism of language. Burnside's lyric exists in double. It is both a dream and a waking threat. The lovers meet simultaneously in an attic room and they're out in nature, pure as animals, and they bell and cry beneath a hunting moon. In this poem, as in many of his others, Burnside emphasizes the sense of sound. There's the dove caught in the throat and the swarming bees, and then finally those verbs bell and cry. And I love how he's turned the um, word bell into a verb, which I don't think I've heard before. But it is scent that I want to revisit, Jane Kenyon's private spice drifting up, which in turn evokes the Neruda line that inspired the title of this talk. I don't love you as if you were the salt rose, topaz, or arrow of carnations that propagate fire. I love you as certain dark things are loved, secretly, between the shadow and the soul. I love you as the plant that doesn't bloom, 
and carries hidden within itself the light of those flowers. And thanks to your love, darkly in my body lives the dense fragrance that rises from the earth. I love you without knowing how or when or from where. I love you simply without problems or pride. I love you in this way because I don't know any other way of loving but this in which there is no I or you, so intimate that your hand upon my chest is my hand, so intimate that when I fall asleep, it is your eyes that close. Chilean poet Pablo Neruda wrote with exuberant abundance about love and sex, hummingbirds and bees, wine and fruits and vegetables and socks, among many other vast subjects. The 100 love sonnets prove him to be one of poetry's most sensual and imaginative voices of desire. This sonnet, to me, reads like an intimate letter. It proceeds by negation and repetition. It begins with the ways he doesn't love his beloved, and then it reveals the secret shadow world of his devotion. Like Jane Kenyon's spice, Neruda's fragrance is private, and it becomes more powerful for its clandestine nature. The poem invites the reader into the dark interior of the body. It asks, us, it asks us to picture these imaginary flowers and their strange light. This fragrance rises unbidden, uncontainable, dense, and vegetative. It comes from beyond the human world, but also suggests female arousal and this vital erotic life that these lovers share. It also makes the confessions of the final stanzas more tangible. If you notice, he... he um, doesn't have any images really at the, in the last two stanzas and so that, that image of the plant that doesn't bloom and then the fragrance really anchors this whole poem. I believe that it is the most potent image in the sonnet. We want some experience of, of transformation, which that's a big word, but I, I would say the best poems there's, a, there's an aliveness um, in there and then we have a response of you know, I don't want to say from the heart because that sounds a little cheesy, <laughs> but that something internal seems to shift after you read the poem. Louise Gluck also writes about scent in one of her most famous or infamous poems, Mock Orange. I remember being shocked the first time I read Mock Orange in my contemporary American poetry class in college, masterfully taught by Cleopatra Mathis. Its lines were stark, declarative, and almost devoid of imagery. The tone was cold to the point of being hostile. I couldn't decide if I hated or loved the poem, or both, but the voice fascinated me, its jaded discontent and its mythic authority, as if speaking from on high about human intimacy. It seemed to reveal truths about men and women that no one else dared to utter. It is not the moon, I tell you. It is these flowers lighting the yard. I hate them. I hate them as I hate sex, the man's mouth sealing my mouth, the man's paralyzing body, and the cry that always escapes, the low, humiliating premise of union. In my mind tonight, I hear the question and pursuing answer fused in one sound that mounts and mounts and then is split into the old selves the tired antagonisms. Do you see? We were made fools of, and the scent of mock orange drifts through the window. How can I rest? How can I be content when there is still that odor in the world? It's interesting because I actually chose the poems intuitively without, uh, without realizing that I think mock orange is like the poetic inverse of the Naroda poem. Um, it, it uses some of the same techniques, repetition, but Louise Gluck repeats hate rather than love. And, and curiously, she uses similar details in her images, the light of flowers in the dark, the scent of blossoms drifting. But rather than being captivated by desire, this speaker has been shamed by it, the low, humiliating premise of union. Mock serves as the key word here. Although, and this is what I love so much, and this is, I think, what the best poets do, 
mock orange is an actual plant. It's a deciduous shrub that blooms in the late spring with delicate white flowers and a distinctive heady citrus fragrance that perfumes the garden. So this isn't just something that Louise Gluck has created for the sake of the poem. You know, it's, it lives and breathes and, and has a smell out in nature. We were made fools of. That's one of my favorite lines. The speaker states this mercilessly. The memory of shared passion mocks her and torments her, as does the floral scent that drifts through the window. So she's merged the, the shame of this past intimacy with the smell of the mock orange. It drifts through the window to where she lies alone now, questioning. I particularly love how scent morphs into odor in the poem's last line. She, the word changes. It's a subtle change in diction, and it feels somehow distasteful and pungent. When you read silently, it's just you. It's a very private experience that happens through the eyes rather than through the ear. So the words or the text comes in through a different sense than it would if you just receive it orally. And poetry was originally an oral tradition. So in a way, it's the most, I think, authentic way to receive a poem is, is to have it read. Um, which isn't to say that being alone with the page or with a book isn't also lovely, but it is different. Um, and, and it's probably different for all people in terms of what kind of a reader you are. I think some people would always prefer to have something read to them and others want to be, have their eyes on the words on the page. I want to fall all over you like a farm, to bless your fields with weeping, fists of hail, black feathers in a frenzy out of their wrecked nests, simple gracious rain on your white grapes, or a holy blizzard of pain, my tornadoes tearing up your prairies, my red wind licking its initials in the dust. I love this. This is an astonishing love poem. It's actually, Dear Earth, this is a love poem from the sky. So take a time and, and read it later. And it ends with this frenzy of action, my tornadoes tearing up your prairies, my wet red wind licking its initials in the dust. What an unexpected metaphor for passion to represent desire as red wind and dusty earth rather than with two human bodies. So when I was 21, I was moved by that river. I observed it, and I swam it, and I wrote poems about its seasons. And in a sentimental gesture that now feels impossibly young, I even mentioned it in the acknowledgments section of my thesis, The Half-Life of Desire, I said to the Connecticut, my sixth housemate, thank you for keeping watch over me in the past nine months. These days, it's usually the woods that move me, the oak and maple stands shading the rolling foothills of West Brattleboro and the dirt roads near my home. I guess that's something that is always surprising to me that even with our you know, high tech world and here we are on our phones and texting and on the internet doing all this remote stuff that's not actually real and tangible that especially living where we live here uh, there can be these experiences which are just profoundly embodied for example you know biting into a peach or walking out the door in January when it's three degrees <laughs> and you feel that you're um, in a way at, a mercy, at the mercy of the seasons I mean that's what we are here you can't deny it um, that, that these seasons, the rhythms of the seasons, the changes of the seasons do determine our experiences. So I wrote this poem in a rush of elation following a run up a mountain trail in May. It was the precipitous hot spring of 2012 when the mercury reached about 90 degrees in March and then the season never slowed down, the trees leafing out two weeks early. Running through the green world, I felt like a conduit for the life force. That spring, I was intoxicated with another writer, and I channeled that longing into new poems that sang of ver verbal abundance and traced the unfolding of plants and the movements of animals occurring around me. Now, it does feel presumptuous to discuss my work following that of my literary heroes, Jane Kenyon, Pablo Neruda, Luis Gluck, but channeling also invokes the dense fragrance that rises from the earth and it merges nature with desire in a single lyric moment. 
I told you May was too much, too much. Knee deep in buttercups, I run again to the mountain, beat a path through drenched clover to the cut in the trees, that quiet arbor where woods transform into rainforest, luxuriant air at skin temperature, though I am almost skinless. I can feel the canopy photosynthesizing, green cells drinking light, making sugar. Sweet ferns unfurl in a spiral from curled pocket to lush frond. Striped maple leaves spread wider than a man's palm. Stinging nettles edge the path beside wild geranium, but I slip past unscathed again to the summit where hunger surprises me, rising in a fever of chlorophyll and memory your hand on my thigh, your words in my mouth, as I lie back on moss and grass, open to the sky. Hot sun burns through cloud, and light, light, light blooms around my eyes, a tremor spiraling from deep within the body, leaving my fingers glazed with honey that smells of rainwater, leaves, mosses, and ocean. There's a poem I would just like to hear. Sure, which hear. one? It's on page 68. Okay. Very short. Oh my gosh, this is the shortest poem, one of the shortest poems I've ever written. Yeah, and actually, so this is from the same May that I was talking about in channeling. So it was, I don't know if you remember that three years ago we just had this incredible spring and everything happened. Or, you know, if you're a gardener, you're aware that when your poppies, when your peonies open and if it's happening, you know, so fast and so quickly. So. Des Abus in May. Thunderstorms beat the pollen from the trees, swell the river wide as a foreign delta. I wake to the poppies half shattered, their silks disheveled, fur centers bared, like a woman stepping out of a red dress. Poetry matters because it captures the touchstone moments of our lives, our griefs, our loves, our fears, our hopes. It's what we turn to when our own voice, or even the, the prose language, which is more pedestrian or more ordinary, feels insufficient. We want that heightened language.